While Disney's Hollywood Studios is currently experiencing a transformation that leave many questioning if the park is due for a new theme, there's still plenty of elements that tie into its original focus, which is the world of Hollywood and movies. One of those elements is the sci-fi dine-in theater restaurant. It transports guests back to the golden age of drive-in movie theaters and features a 47 minute long reel that plays on the big screen which includes film trailers, newsreels, and animated shorts. Today we're going to take a look at the history of drive-ins as well as some of the very real sci-fi movies that play at the sci-fi dine-in restaurant. While the sci-fi dine-in is modeled after the prime era of drive-ins during the 1950s, the concept of drive-in theaters itself dates back nearly 20 years earlier to 1933. A man named Richard Hollingshead Jr. from Camden, New Jersey was working for his father's company, Wiz Auto Products, when he had an idea. Now some sources online claim that Richard was trying to think of a more comfortable movie-going experience for his mother when he came up with the idea of a drive-in theater. However, there are more business-centric roots to this idea. Believing that credit was a liability to his father's company, Richard looked for new ideas that dealt in cash. His initial idea was to create deluxe, tiki-themed gas stations complete with a restaurant and films. It'd be a place for drivers to service their cars, fill their tanks, and meet other people. Cause you know, that's what you're looking to do when you go to the gas station. Grab a meal and meet other people. At the same time, the stock market had crashed just four years prior, and the country was in the middle of the Great Depression. However, even with economic woes, Richard noticed that many people still made a priority out of going to the movies. It offered an escape at an affordable price during a time where reality was especially grim. So when the deluxe gas station idea was trimmed down, it was the movie concept that stuck around. Hollingshead felt that the added comfort of getting to stay in your car would be appealing to movie-going audiences. You wouldn't have to get all dressed up for a night out. After some experimenting in his home driveway, Hollingshead filed a patent for the drive-in theater and expanded it to its own standalone company when he formed Park Inn Theaters Incorporated. To keep it short, the following 16 years would be both successful and litigious for Hollingshead. He managed to build a company out of drive-ins and licensed out the idea to others across the country. However, he began to find it increasingly difficult to enforce the patent against those who simply refused to pay for the license. In 1949, the First Circuit Court of Appeals ruled 3-0 that the original patent was invalid as the concept wasn't something that could be patented to begin with. According to the judges, the idea lacked invention. It was just a natural adaptation to the way most theaters in the world are laid out. This meant that the concept for a drive-in theater was fair game, and with the post-World War II economic, industrial, and baby booms occurring, it meant that the country was primed for the growth of drive-ins. More and more people were owning their own cars, and they wanted to drive their new cars, and they wanted to see new films, and teenagers on dates wanted some sense of privacy. It offered a novel experience that the television industry, which was budding at that time, couldn't reproduce. And so at its peak, it was estimated that there were nearly 4,100 drive-in theaters across the country. However, drive-ins still played second fiddle to the more ubiquitous traditional movie theater. So even with their growth in popularity, many drive-ins were showing second or third run films rather than the big motion pictures premiering at the time. Now at the same time this was all happening, there was a movement in the film industry. Science fiction films were nothing new. In fact, they dated back to the early days of cinema with films like George Millay's A Trip to the Moon. However, with the introduction of atomic weaponry at the end of World War II, and the start of the Cold War after World War II, science fiction found itself growing in popularity. 1951's The Day the Earth Stood Still was a great example. It was a creative outlet for the anxiety that the public was beginning to feel about Cold War tensions and the impact a potential atomic or nuclear war could have on not just the country, but the world. More importantly, it was a creative outlet that performed well at the box office, grossing nearly $1.9 million that year against a $900,000 budget. And if there is one constant when it comes to Hollywood, it is that when something does well, you can be sure to expect a bunch of copycats. The 1950s saw an increase in sci-fi films, some of which were good, and many of which weren't. 
and while they did grow in popularity, they weren't taking the spotlight quite yet. That cultural shift would take a little bit longer. So oftentimes they would be added on as the second film in a double feature, otherwise known as the B-movies. So now you have drive-ins, growing in popularity but still playing less prestigious films, and you also have sci-fi movies, growing in popularity but still taking a backseat to the more mainstream titles. You put the two together, and suddenly sci-fi B-movies start to find a home at drive-in theaters. The sci-fi dine-in theater restaurant at Hollywood Studios features many sci-fi films from the era. And while most don't really deserve a full-blown look into its history, here are some fun facts for the next time you're dining in at the restaurant and spot some of these films on the big screen. 1954's Devil Girl from Mars, directed by David McDonald, was allegedly written and filmed in just 10 days. It follows the tale of a group of people at a Scottish inn as a Martian lands on Earth to kidnap men for her home planet. As the story goes, the producers, the Danzinger brothers, booked the studio space to film 26 episodes of a series called Mayfair Mysteries. According to screenwriter John Mather, the production wrapped up 10 days early, and with the rest of the studio use already paid for, he was tasked by the producers with writing a sci-fi film to shoot in the remaining time. And that would become Devil Girl from Mars. As I said earlier, copycatting was not rare back in these days. Then again, I guess it's not rare today either. 1957's The Amazing Colossal Man, directed by Burt Gordon, was a cash-in on that same year's The Incredible Shrinking Man. In a reversal of The Incredible Shrinking Man, Colossal Man is about Glenn Manning, a lieutenant colonel who is exposed to the radiation of an atomic bomb test and begins to grow uncontrollably. It, too, was filmed over a period of just 10 days. The following year, director Nathan Juren would try and cash in on The Amazing Colossal Man and made a film that was originally titled The Astounding Giant Woman. It was renamed before it premiered to Attack of the 50-Foot Woman and managed to beat both Devil Girl and Colossal Man's feet by being filmed in just eight days. I'm starting to see a link here between rushed shooting schedules and quality. Robot Monster, released in 1953, was filmed in just four days around Bronson Canyon in California. It's most notable for the fact that the Robot Monster was ultimately just a giant gorilla suit with a sci-fi helmet. The director, Phil Tucker, claims that while the film was budgeted at $50,000, he only really had $16,000 to make the film. It was said that the relationship between Tucker and the financiers of the film ended up so tense and poor that Tucker wasn't even allowed to see the final film at the premiere. He had to buy a ticket like everyone else. The Horror of Party Beach, released in 1964, was part of a double feature by director Del Tenney. He grouped it with a film called Curse of the Living Corpse and managed to earn $1 million off of the pair. My favorite quote from Tenney, said years later, is, quote, People ask me how I can admit that I made these bad movies. I just tell them that I cried all the way to the bank. And of course, it'd be impossible to talk about the films of the sci-fi dine-in theater without talking about Plan 9. Just a movie? You don't understand. This isn't Plans 1 through 8 from outer space. This is Plan 9. <laughs> this is the one that worked. The worst movie ever made! Arguably director Ed Wood's most famous film, 1958's Plan 9 from Outer Space is often cited as one of the worst movies of all time. The movie stars silent film era actor Bela Lugosi, who was most famous for playing Dracula. However, Lugosi passed away with only just a few minutes of footage shot, so most of the film features a body double who uses their cape to hide their face. There are a ton of resources on the famous So Bad It's Good sci-fi film, including Tim Burton's 1994 film Ed Wood, which chronicled the career of the director. The 1950s was an era in which the way we consumed films and the films we consumed were reflective of the world we lived in. Sure, there are still some drive-ins today, and there is no shortage of low-quality sci-fi. But there will never be a time quite like that era that the sci-fi dine-in theater transports us to.